While we get settled in our, as usual, gradual fashion, I'm going to turn on uh, one of the videos involving the last two CEOs of Polaroid, and then after that we'll get into our normal routine. Most people thought that the company needed to change. Um, uh, not because they thought it was in deep trouble or, or again, a, the, the Didn't you hear that in the back? burning platform at the time. But they thought that we, we needed to find the next big technology, the next big idea. And, and they felt that it was out there someplace that, and we would invent it. Again, the culture would would say, we'll find it, we'll invent it, and we'll develop it and create it. Better? Uh, there was not a lot of thought of partnering outside or using other people's technology. I think that's one of the pains, probably, of its demise, is it was, well, a member of the family died in this thing, and that was tough, very tough for me, and I know tough for a lot of guys. Um, and Pardon. I can almost get, you know, weepy about it at times. Um, <laughs> And to come to the conclusion that that train, that, that, that family was based on, or that thought that the family was based on, and the products, and Dr. Land's visions, and all that was going to change, was like saying, you know, uh, I'm terrible at my analogies, but, um, you know, the family's got to change, guys. And that was tough. That was very tough to do. But, um, and I should have been more forceful. That's fine. Right? You know, I should have probably been, uh, it's going to change, guys, and if you can't get on the boat, you know, better get off in a hurry. Instead of getting off next week, you better get off this afternoon. It clearly had um, a culture. Uh, uh, very talented people, um, very proud, um, very accomplished, um, highly intellectual. Um, very self-sufficient, can do, uh, willing to work very hard, uh, but a very entitled culture. Uh, very clear to me that they felt, everyone felt entitled to uh, their things, whether it be material or intellectual, uh, their role, their department. Uh, so, and also, you know, their benefits, uh, probably the richest benefits, uh, Hewitt and Company, which who are consultants, uh, compensation consultants, the richest benefits they'd ever seen in America. Were we spoiled because we made large margins on film? I think possibly that's a, you could argue that point. Uh, we weren't, I mean, we had competition. Inst, I mean, instant photography was competing constantly with conventional photography. Now, if you call image making the field, if you call it about instant photography, if you narrow it down to instant photography, we had no competition until 19, whatever it was, 76 or something like that, when Kodak came in, and then Fuji came in later. Um, did that make us complacent? Is that the question? Um, possibly. Uh, uh, um, I never felt I was resting. I always felt I had more on my plate than I could barely choke down. We had an inferiority complex, I think, for a long time, and that the quality of instant photography was not up to the quality of conventional photography. Um, and we were spent hours and hours and hours and millions and billions of dollars, I guess, almost, focusing on getting, closing that quality gap. And we got pretty darn close in the end. Um, I don't think we ever got par exactly, but we got very close. Did we spend too much time on it? Well, it's, um, how much time did we spend on trying to be good? I don't know if you can put a, a value on that. Maybe we did, maybe we did. Dr. Land was obsessed with it. I became infection, infected and was obsessed by it. It's 
spent a lot of my lifetime trying to get that product on a level playing field. I think every product has a life cycle. Um, I think every company has a life cycle. I think every human being has a life cycle. I think you have to recognize part of your job as, as a CEO is to recognize where you are in that life cycle and not where you wish to be. I think certain members of the board were surely interested in that we spend more of our energy and effort um, covering the big marketing picture um, and not uh, be solely influenced by the research and engineering kind of mentality. They wanted us to pay attention more to what the customers were potentially thinking about versus what we thought we had the grand idea and we were going to lay it on them. Which I think, historically, uh, you might too simplistically say that uh, that was the origin of the company, it was more of the invention of the idea, and then here it is, customer, um, versus what do you need out there and let us try to provide it to you. We never, I think, had a full concurrence on what marketing meant. There were those that said, well, gee, you should have raised the price of the film or cut the price of the film, and, you know, the price of the film wasn't, wasn't going to change it. This was technological change. Uh, this was not a marketing problem. My price break at the time was under $50. I thought the electronic image cameras had to get down to and I thought in 10 years they would get there. And lo and behold, it's taken just about 10 years for it to get there. Um, but I... What do you think of those guys? Do you like them? Great. We're going to see part of each slide. Oh, there we go. Um, we've got two cases this week, Polaroid and Enron. Uh, there are two cases of dramatic success uh, and then dramatic failure. And in understanding capitalism, think back to everything we've done so far, the idea of abrupt change of equilibrium always being dislodged, equilibrium always disrupted, uh, the cardiothoracic systems case from the end of last week uh, was exactly such a story, and Polaroid is very much such a story. Uh, Enron has a darker cast to it. Uh, it entails uh, the darker side of uh, the human soul. And we'll hear about that from uh, Jim Alexander, uh, who lived right through the middle of it on Wednesday. This is a tracing of the sales volume of Polaroid. Uh, from 1957 until the firm's demise. Uh, one of the things you can, that is of interest about this diagram, is that the sales at death uh, were not dramatically below their all-time peak. So sales alone don't tell you uh, enough to understand what happened. Uh, and this is the stock price. And this is, what are stock prices about? What's the, what are the drivers? I, I'm not asking for anything fancy here. What are the drivers? Yes, back left. Uh, expected future earnings. Okay, expected future earnings. Uh, along with some special sauce having to do with future strategy to maintain share price. Interest rates. Uh, and how would interest rates play into this? 
Okay, but what, just for those of us who are from Illinois, uh, spell it out a little at a time. Who's from Illinois here? I apologize. Hell, I should have said Indiana, I'm from there. Okay, spell it out for us. Uh, a lower interest rate will yield a higher stock price because there will be less of a trade-off um, between uh, spending today and what you get tomorrow. Well, sort of. Jim, do you want to help with that? They really are a projection of future cash flows to the shareholders. It's just that uh, it used to be in the 50s, 60s, 70s dividends that were the bulk of those assumptions. And today it's, uh, it's a rare company that pays more than 1% or 2% dividend yield on a stock price. So really it's projection of earnings as you yeah. encapsulated. And when you look at that chart, what you see is the typical problem with a lot of growth stocks, and that is that people buy onto a whole new paradigm and then extrapolate for decades. Uh, and you end up with a, with a stock price that really bears uh, no resemblance to, uh, to current earnings. And an increase in interest rates, how, do, how would that be? Well, that would, uh, an, an increase in all other things being equal, an increase in, in current interest rates would lower the stock price because you'd have to be compensated for the, the extra time value of money involved. Thanks. Sales, this is a curve in red that we saw in the first slide, uh, with uh, long-term debt superposed. Sales reads on the left axis and debt leads, reads on the right. Anything to learn from that slide? This, this is not a, this is not a curveball. Polaroid didn't have any debt until relatively recently in their life cycle. We pretty much started during the recession in the 1980s. Right. Uh -oh. And uh, was the debt likely to be important there toward the end? Uh, well, yeah, because they filed for bankruptcy. They did, and what was the precise event that caused them to file? It's in the Q, the 10Q filing in the case. Anybody notice that? The takeover attempt? Or? No. Back. Seekonk. 9-11? Uh, not really. It was related to 9-11. What happened was they failed to make a scheduled payment on the debt. And that triggered an avalanche of adverse uh, results, drove the stock price uh, close to zero. And how does the firm end up? What, what, what becomes of it? It gets sold. Sold to private equity, and uh, how much of its value do you think is, of its peak value, is there at the end when it's sold to private equity? You don't have to give me a number, just give me a lot, a little. I think less. Sold for 265 million at that end stage. Now, what was the value proposition? I guess that's a hint. What, was the, what would have caused you, here is a Polaroid Pronto, uh, which hasn't made a picture in a lifetime. Uh, what would have caused, I probably bought over the years three or four of these cameras. I was never terrifically happy with them. Any of you ever own one? They're all way too young, almost all. Tell us, can we get a mic here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, got one as a birthday present, and it was a fun novelty for like three months. Uh-huh. How, how old were you? Um, I was eight. Okay. <laughs> so you probably didn't have an independent account for buying film? No. And 
do you have any memory of how the film's price compared? Well, you didn't buy the camera. No, I didn't know anything about the pricing. I just like that it came out instant. Okay, did anyone own one at, a, at, a, at an age older than eight? Back center. Uh, I had my grandmother's old one. I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> so I, get, I can guess what you paid for the camera. Yeah, I, I mean, it was a hand-me-down, and I took like 10 pictures with it, and not, there was no film left. And I asked my mom if we could buy more, and she was like, no, we're just gonna get a disposable for you. Okay, so um, the sales metaphor in the case, anybody remember what, what, what analogy do they draw in the, in the marketing strategy? Back there, yes. It was on razor and blade. Razor and blade, help us understand that. Uh, yeah, basically, um, you know, for instance, a company that sells razors, they're not making that much money on the actual price of the razor. And, you know, some could argue they could even give that to you. They, their profit really comes from that people have to buy blades in order to use the razor. Okay, great. Can we think of any, uh, any other analogies uh, in marketing strategies here in the alligator shirt? Printers and ink cartridges. Printers and cartridges. You, you've noticed that the printers sell for nothing and the cartridges cost your firstborn child. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it's not a bad strategy, right? Because most of us uh, try, to, try to minimize the initial cash outlay when we buy something. And then you get hit in the back of the head by the maintenance of it. And that was the strategy for Polaroid. And it was, in some periods, a very successful strategy. Um, what's the value proposition? We get two dimensions here. Not very, let's put them together, actually. The quality dimension. Think this is 1948. This is the first Polaroid camera on the retail market. Um, it was much too, I was nine at the time, so I, I can empathize with you guys. Uh, but I was nowhere near rich enough to purchase a Polaroid land camera. It was a, it was a very upscale, fancy idea. Uh, but I did see pictures made with it, and they were sepia tone uh, and muddy, uh, very low contrast. They were very bad compared with uh, what could be produced by conventional photography. And the, the question was, let's think about three kinds of consumers. And this was largely a consumer product. It had scientific and business applications and industrial applications. But from Land's point of view, all the way along, the real darling was the amateur photographer. And let's use indifference curves in this space. So we've got speed on the horizontal dimension and quality on the vertical dimension. And a person who says, I'm indifferent between all these outcomes, how would we describe that person's preference? Sorry, a professional, if, if he's indifferent to the speed, um, and is only concerned with quality. I'm unable to locate you. Where are you? Wave. Oh, hi. It would be a professional or perfectionist, okay. right? Sure. The model might be Ansel Adams, <laughs> somebody who makes wonderful pictures and is willing to wait, and is virtually indifferent to the time dimension. So that person is trying to climb in this direction, indifference curve over indifference curve. <laughs> And this person, Tim, what's this person up to? They're trying to go out that way as fast as they can. They're trying to get faster and faster pictures? Yeah, cheap thrills. Just like our friend back here when he was eight. Um, all they want is speed. Well, how many customers do you think fit either of these descriptions? 
A few fit the first description, a few fit the second description, but most are more like this. They have a trade-off, which I've simplified with straight lines. They probably would actually bow in toward the origin, like this. Uh, but these people want some combination of speed and quality. And the central drive uh, for the Polaroid land camera from 1948 uh, all the way to the end was to do as well as possible in competing for the business of these people who were trading off uh, the two dimensions. Uh, the SX-70, uh, which was in some ways the high point of Polaroid's history and in other ways the low point. Any, can anybody remember what was wrong with the SX-70? Had battery problems. It had, yeah. How, do, you, do you remember from the case how how the how the battery was related to the thing? Okay. Um, I think Jim Jim Alexander and I are the only people here who ever ever experienced this. The battery was included in the film pack, and for the first couple of years they made it, about half the batteries were no good. So if you spent a premium for the film pack and the battery wouldn't make the camera run, you were likely to be an unhappy customer. And they had a very high complaint rate about that. Does anybody remember what they did to resolve the battery problem? Back, or, yeah, up here, that's fine. Uh, they manufacture their own batteries? Yeah, they went into the battery manufacturing business which is, as we'll see in a minute, it's an integration move where they reduce their reliance on outside suppliers but create a whole set of new problems for themselves because it turns out it's not very easy to ma manufacture batteries well. Uh, the Polaroid SX-70 had gained enormous ground on conventional photography on the quality dimension it was a lot better than the old Polaroid. Uh, but it was still nobody, drunk or sober, uh, would argue that the pictures produced by the Polaroid SX-70 were as good as those produced by a conventional single, 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 what's it called, SLR, single lens reflex 35 millimeter camera with competent processing. And so they were in a position where they had a deficit on the quality side, which they never actually overcame. They did better and better on picture quality, but they never really got to where they matched conventional photography. Uh, so the, I've drawn this so that they're on a higher indifference curve for this particular consumer than the conventional photography. Uh, but there were several problems lurking in that. One of them, how could this have happened without any improvement in either the film or the camera on the conventional side? The conventional photographic technology uh, gained ground on the speed dimension and gained a lot of it. Um, With the advent of the one hour photo. Okay, so the one hour photo processing <laughs> took three days or five business days and brought it down to an errand. You drop the film off, go have a cup of coffee, come back. So that conventional photography with no internal improvement was closing the speed gap and diminishing total demand for instant photography. Um, now, there's, a, there's an incident at about this stage between Polaroid and Kodak. Anybody remember how that goes? How had, had Kodak played any part in Polaroid's business, uh, any cooperative part 
in the early years? Sasha. Yeah, it, Kodak was manufacturing for Polaroid. And as it manufactured, it learned the secret sauce. And then went into the business, competing and competing effectively against Polaroid with a tricked up reconfiguration of Polaroid's technology. And Polaroid responded with a lawsuit. And they won the lawsuit. They nonetheless got screwed. How could that be? They win the law, they get a, a, a billion dollars in damages, or, or just a little short of a billion dollars in damages. And yet, Polaroid's uh, theft is all but lethal to them. Um, I think it took them a lot of time and effort to fight that case, and when they finally got the reward, it wasn't as much as they expected. And then there was also this comment later that they kind of wished that Kodak had, they had merged with Kodak, and that hadn't even happened either because Kodak did not, had too much of an ego to kind of do that either. Both sides had a lot of ego. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a, you, you got it. What was needed was an immediate intervention. The case went on almost 15 years. And while it was going on, Kodak was eating into the competitive position occupied by Polaroid. There's of course something else going on here. And that's the emergence of digital. And digital photography, with one important asterisk, uh, trumped everything. And it didn't stand still. It traced a path, and it's still on that path, of virtually continuous improvement. A $200 digital camera now is as good as a $10,000 digital camera a decade ago. And the, uh, hands up if you use a dig digital camera. Yeah, everybody. And on average, I, my guess is that your digital cameras are about like that. They're tiny. Uh, are they hard to work? Do the batteries fail? There's only one thing they don't do very well. What's that? Well, they, don't, they actually do that better than conventional cameras, but no camera does that very well. What's, uh, my mother hates them. Why would, why would a 95-year-old? They don't print. They don't print. Her idea of a photo is something you hold in your hands. And it's not a real photo unless she can hold it in her hands, put it on the coffee table, show it to her friends from the coffee table, Right? And Edwin Land actually agreed with that. And it was part of his, uh, part of his infatuation with the original Polaroid idea was that you make the picture, wave it for a minute till it dries, and hand it to the people who are in the, in the view. Now, I, I'm, we're gonna go back to the case in this informal way in just a minute. But I'm going to talk about integration here because vertical integration is a huge part of the Polaroid story. And it's a part, an important part of most uh, corporate stories. Vertical integration is the, it, the think of the dimension that starts with uh, raw products uh, or coming out of a mine. Uh, sugar cane coming out of a field, uh, bananas coming out of a rainforest. And then there is a progression toward a manufacturing or processing plant, or perhaps a series of manufacturing steps. Uh, then uh, the distribution of the product to wholesalers and from wholesalers to retailers and from retailers to the family picnic. And a, fully, a full story of vertical integration looks like this. Everything's in the corporate box from beginning to end. 
The plus of that is obvious. The trouble you might have with your suppliers is completely eliminated. And the, the ability to direct the details of every step uh, is seemingly unlimited. The downside, there are at least two obvious downsides. One is, a lot of companies are good at the front end without being good at the back end. So if they go from the front end, from marketing a retail product, all the way back to the first steps of its production, they may well screw up because it's just not what they do well. Uh, that's one difficulty. Another difficulty is governance. The management of a vertically integrated company is a very complicated process. And it tends, as with the railroads we saw a week ago, it tends to bloat the administrative apparatus, make it have many dimensions from top to plant floor, uh, and presents serious challenges. Now, that's only half the story. The other half of vertical integration has to do with ideas. There's a pair, the, what I just talked about has to do with physical stuff, material things. There is also an intellectual track or ideational track, which starts with dreams or ideas drawn on the back of a napkin and then invoke science and engineering and design and a marketing plan. It is in effect the brains behind the lower box and with Polaroid, you had a fully integrated company. Now, they didn't do mines and fields, but you had uh, a high degree of vertical in integration in the ideas process and almost as high a degree of integration in the material uh, process. So you end up there. Now, Why did this company fail? Let's, uh, let's, let's start with, I've got um, warm calls. Ahmed? Yeah, Ahmed. Why do you think the company failed? They failed because of the capabilities and beliefs of the 1980s. Um, that influenced their strategies, couldn't, uh, they were more technology driven and not market driven and, and reasons and so forth. Because of the senior management. Okay. Uh, who was this Edwin Land guy? He was a scientist. Who he was a scientist? When does he get his start as an inventor? Does anybody remember from the case? 37. Pardon? Oh. Harvard College. Harvard College? He's an undergraduate, and he invents Polaroid filters. Clever lad. And he gets fixated, I think, on a certain view of how you do wonderful things. And it focuses on long, costly, time-consuming research. Uh, Lindsay Jackson, uh, anything to add to that? About, about land or about the causes of failure? Well, I think to go off of uh, land, I, it, it was genius what he was able to do, and he was so technology driven, and he was able to create such a successful uh, company, and at a certain point they didn't have any competition, or no real competition. No direct competition. And because the technology was what was driving them and it proved to be successful, as the company grew older, they got fixated on this idea that technology was what was, what was going to drive them, so they were hesitant to change. That's terrific. So we combine an initial fixation <laughs> on a very intellectualized R&D process, which is very slow and mildly contemptuous of marketing. And we combine that with a wildly successful market product, which was not designed 
by careful analysis of consumer indifference curves. It was designed by Edwin Land's passion for this product. He correctly guessed, he lucked out. He correctly guessed that it would command an enormous uh, consumer market, and sure enough, it did. So we've got a kind of path-dependent story there. And Ben Chu, uh, is there anything left to talk about on this, or are we done? When Polaroid was developing its newer technologies, um, it's important to realize that it's not that they were just stuck in the Stone Age. They were trying to develop. They made forays into digital imagery. Yes. But they still were, excuse me, they were still shackled by the idea of making money with the razor blade uh, marketing strategy and really making money with um, putting on film. Absolutely. There's a wonderful quote toward the end of the piece you guys read. Do you remember it? Yeah, there's no need. To, you don't need to. <laughs> I, I can tell it. Uh, here it is. The, uh, um, they're talking about what a wonderful um, and highly marketable device the digital camera is. And, the, and this is a, a, a marketing person talking to a senior executive. And the senior executive's response is, where's the film? That's where the money is. And of course, there is no film and there is no money in film. All the money is in the hardware. And that was a hard idea for Polaroid's top management to square with the initial model base, based on razors and razor blades. The, there's another idea that appears in, this is one of the papers cited at the end of the, the um, case. There's another idea there that may be important and it's called bounded rationality. Hum if bounded rationality is a familiar concept. Okay, we should stop and talk about it. Uh, Edwin Land, let's say his IQ was 290. Um, I, I, since they divide by age, I think you'd, he, he would have had to be about age three when it was measured for that to be even logically possible. But uh, let's suppose he's the smartest guy in the world. Uh, he nonetheless thinks in bounded rationality. And what that means is, in order to get started thinking about something, you have to explicitly or implicitly make a bunch of assumptions. And those assumptions are typically arbitrary. You can't examine every aspect of every assumption and ever get anything done intellectually. It's a true statement. Uh, and the task of managing a company is exceedingly complex. And Edwin Land and Mac Booth and the other people, you have this very messy chart here that I took down from the, the case. Uh, none of these senior executives was ultimately able to think in a way that was effective because the bounding assumptions uh, prohibited it. And what's so hard about this? What would make it hard to run Polaroid or Ford Motor Company. Uh, what? Yes? Because the assumptions that they were. Polaroid, to begin with, was basically a research driven company, and the assumptions that they were making, the benchmark was that Polaroid is a research driven company, which in effect was not correct because. As the markets were changing, it sapped Polaroid's ability to be nimble and respond to the competition that was there. Okay, great. Is there, is there an analogy in what happened to them in anything about the cardiothoracic systems case? What was the, what was, I thought Karen did a, Sharon, Sharon did a fabulous job of teaching it. Uh, and why was it that 
the two artery strategy for uh, cardiothoracic systems uh, had to be abandoned. Remember? Some of you said it. Well, it is this, that the companies who were making the, the devices for non-surgical intervention, the stents and the little balloons and all that stuff, were what kind of companies? Huge, well-funded companies, which were not going to let somebody come in and take market share without developing a new step of competitive device. And one of the very hard things about running a big company is that you have to be aware of all the other players out there who may be doing something to damage your market. They probably aren't even trying to damage your market. They are probably not even thinking much about you, but instead trying to develop their own boundedly rational idea of their company. And in this case, Polaroid was badly bitten both by uh, uh, one hour film processing uh, and by uh, digitals. And in the case of the one hour film processing, it wasn't even the processors so much who were in competition with Polaroid, but the conventional film people such as Kodak. So part of the story then is bounded rationality. Part of it has to do with drawing the wrong, wrong lessons from early success. Part of it has to do with something totally irrational, which was the commitment to a founder figure. Does it, is it generally the case that brilliant engineers run huge companies which uh, produce the products based on their ideas? So generally, it's not generally the case. I mean, we can all name cases, but in general, the engineers who create devices are uh, forced out of top management and replaced by people who are general managers. And that's what happened, that's what ha happened at Polaroid, but it happened too late. It happened much too late. Now, if you were going to save Polaroid, let's say in the 1980s, let's suppose you are Mac Booth, and it's your task to give this company the best chance of preserving its value going into the future, what would you do? Well, what they did do was a hell of a lot of R&D on a long string of projects which failed, right? From a, some of them were artistic or engineering successes, but none of them were economic successes. Polar Vision was a disaster. Helios was a uh, was actually a really good product, but they didn't manage to recoup their investment. Uh, what would you have done? If you're, can we have the mic? I'm about to cold call you. You ready? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm actually visiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to cold call you anyway. You, it, it, the nice thing is you don't have anything at risk. <laughs> okay. Well, you didn't read the case, so that, that's unfair. Um, are you? Okay, good. Uh, what might you have done to save this company? I really do agree with what Booth said. He said that he would have probably merged with Fuji and kind of used the best aspects of both because Fuji was moving forward, hopefully in digital, and they were still kind of doing instant photography. Because one of the things that they were still, I think, fixated upon was instant photography, what the founder founded. So they were, it was that kind of cult. And they weren't really moving on towards other things and like improving on other things. Okay, all. so a merger, prop, a merger might well have been the best play. Now, why, why would it, what would make it hard to do? I think it's the culture of the company. Um, the, they wouldn't, it's a whole ego trip thing. They were really proud of what they had achieved, and the vertical integration was part of the reason they were so proud of it. Okay, so part of it is culture. I think that debt of theirs would have 
weaken their bargaining position. Right. Um, and yes. So rather than uh, merging a company, would I, I think Polaroid could have done something in lines of what IBM is doing now, become a completely research-based company, cut out their marketing, cut out their consumer processes, and just um, research for Fuji research, for conduct new uh, research designs for other companies who are in the consumer field. So cut down on your vertical integration. Okay, so that, may, that might actually, that makes a certain kind of sense. Talk a little more and defend the idea. What? Uh, because at the end of the day, the whole company culture was driven, uh, was driven towards uh, cutting edge research. A lot of their successful products were because they were able to invent and create products that were uh, successful on lines of not successful marketing, not, uh, not successful marketing strategies, but they were able to um, create products which were ahead of the curve in terms of technology. So since the whole market, the industry was moving towards the digital platform, perhaps they could um, become leaders of developing these technologies which will improve digital products in the future. Okay, uh, that's a, a very interesting suggestion. Yes. That the merger wouldn't go well because um, of the vertical integration that, um, that Polaroid had in place. They had huge facilities and machines designed for peak times of sales and um, these high fixed costs would have been uh, a big problem for Kodak, so I think they wouldn't merge with them. I, um, <coughs> that might well be. I mean, they might, have, they might have liquidated those through private equity and kept intact the rest. Well, I think they were specialized on the films of uh, Polaroid. Yeah, okay. Um, let's turn to Enron now. Enron, is another innovation company. Uh, Jim, can you come up for just a second? I didn't warn him about this. Uh, Jim, as, as I said to those of you who were here at the beginning of shopping period, uh, Jim was chief financial officer of Enron Global Power and Pipeline and saw the process uh, from the beginning. He came from a, a long career in investment banking before that. Um, culture of innovation at Enron, was it important from day one when you arrived there as a consultant? Um, yes, it was, there was a culture of innovation uh, that was uh, impressed upon the organization by Ken Lay because he was trying to avoid the mindset that was typical of natural gas pipelines at the time, which is very much a monopoly, rate-based rate of return, uh, doesn't matter to make any money type of mindset, and he went way overboard in reversing that. Okay, and w was Ken Lay a famous manager, and uh, was Enron receiving prizes, for example, from the Harvard Business School as the best-run company in the country? Um, yes, well, I've always thought that uh, one of uh, the Jim is a graduate of Yale College and HBS, yeah. so we whip saw him here. One, one of the things I've always thought people ought to do, though, in terms of looking at, at industries in imminent decline is, is look at plaudits from HBS and the percent of, of graduates from HBS going to a given industry. <laughs> okay, so uh, the case uh, for Wednesday is uh, innovation corrupted. It's an HBS case. It was in that packet of three, which you got a week ago. Uh, please read it with care. Uh, Jim and I will do this uh, uh, interrogatively. Uh, we'll sit together and talk it through and turn to you intermittently for help in solving Enron's dilemmas. 